I wanted really to share some experience, insights, um, and possibilities. And um, just to say that from the beginning of the practice which has produced the kind of buildings that Kent has been talking about, um, uh, been advocating a green architecture since 1967. Um, at that time, it was truly radical. It wasn't mainstream. It wasn't even called uh, green architecture. So, a few words about sustainability. Um, for me, it's really about working with nature. It's about change and innovation, questioning, challenging. It's a belief in technology, but technology in a benign way as a means to social ends. Um, and in that link between all these issues, memory and history is, is a key factor. This is a very recent image, really very direct, self-explanatory. We have to change uh, the, the way in which we consume, create waste, and move into converting waste to energy uh, in such a way that it's a total uh, cycle. And, uh, and if that's a recent image, then if I go back in time to the earliest projects in the late 60s, early 1970s, and it's perhaps a reminder that sometimes the unbuilt projects are the most significant. And in this, which was for a shipping company, uh, a creator, the headquarters, in a forest outside of Oslo in Norway and touching the ground lightly with a series of pavilions. Um, all the recent mantras of recycling, here we're talking about recycling water, converting human waste into fertilizer, uh, ventilating naturally with cool air from the forest floor, encouraging sunlight, solar collectors, Another unbuilt project at that time for the same shipping company uh, which operated cruise ships which returned with produce from the Canary Islands. And this was a regional plan and one tiny glimpse of that project uh, in many ways says it all. It's about solar collecting, there are batteries underneath the, the kitchen, uh, it's converting the human waste into fertilizer for agriculture, it's solar sil uh, stills for creating uh, drinking water from, from seawater. So in a way, all those ingredients are there in the 1970s. I was very fortunate to engage with Buckminster Fuller and collaborate with him for the last 12 years of his life. And the project that we did together, which was for his family and our family at that time, soon to be interestingly realized as a project, is a totally autonomous house. And that house, the whole house would move and a shade would move around it to protect it, to harvest the energy. And I've never really made the connection between that and perhaps a more familiar built project in Berlin, the Reichstag. But in a way, all those elements are there. Here it's a beacon on the skyline of democracy at work. And here you can see the reflector which brings natural light deep into the chamber, reducing the dependency on electricity and that mirror-like cone also extracts the air as part of a ventilation system. And just like the autonomous house, uh, the solar shield moves around according to the sun. Um, in social terms, the public is on top of the politicians who are answerable to them, one above the, the other. And it has this uh, energy manifesto which demonstrates that it's possible for a public building to be zero carbon, zero waste. In this instance, driven by uh, literally vegetable oil. So that belief in working with nature, buildings which can use air at ambient temperature, reduce energy and create a healthier environment. Uh, the very first uh, example of that 
was a centre for the arts um, in East Anglia, the Sainsbury Centre, our first breathing uh, building, no reliance on refrigeration and a very, very literally cool climate. Um, and pioneering, interestingly, here in Germany with Comets Bank, the, uh, the bank on the left, which was the first uh, naturally ventilated, nonetheless a controlled climate, um, augmented but for 70% of the year, literally working with the, with the air. And that developed over the Swiss Re in London and the Hearst Tower uh, in New York. And if I move from the urbanity of New York to Silicon Valley and perhaps look at this project in a little more detail, um, how does one reconcile this image of Silicon Valley with the first meeting with Steve Jobs where he describes this as the fruit bowl, bowl of America in his youth? And, uh, with an awareness that one of Steve's kind of uh, extraordinary uh, abilities was always a meeting was a walk, and ideally a walk in the, in, in the country. So how could one uh, translate that in, in terms of a, of a project? And this was the site, and the statistics of that site uh, and here we see the superimposition of the very familiar circle of a building. The key statistics, I guess, at the bottom there is that half of that site is covered in asphalt and there's very little landscaping. And in its final transformation, there's virtually no tarmac and everything is about the landscape. Now, the interesting thing about this image is also 30% more people on that site. Um, and what appears to be a very large building, and physically it most certainly is, but you have to compare this with a multiplicity of individual buildings. And you don't get the scale from this aerial view. If I was to put you into the heart of that circle, then the building becomes a kind of horizon. And here you see the recreation of that California landscape. If you move outside of that circle to the landscape, the, the other side of the ring, then it becomes very much an incident in the landscape. It's not the only building. There is the Steve Jobs Theater, and the Steve Jobs Theater is almost like a kind of flying saucer in the, in the landscape. Um, it's quite massive, that roof. It's about 80 tons, and it literally sits on a glass wall, a glass curtain, and in the joints between the glass, the services, the electricity, is almost invisibly fed up. So that's a kind of celebration of, of space, of liberation, with this <coughs> structural circle of glass around it. That same use of reflective glass to kind of harmonize with nature uh, these eyebrows are in part of the facade providing shading, but they're also bouncing light deep into the heart of the building. And that external wall virtually disappears. And here you can see the underside of that, which is reflecting that landscape and bringing it in. If I talk about the fusion of the social dimension and also the technology and the quest for a healthier building, then at the top of that sheet of glass, here we see the junction. And you start to see the movement of air. And that controls the flow of air. There are also filters in terms of uh, dust or insects, uh, although it's a very uh, extraordinary, benign California climate. So working with that climate. A lot of the things over the period that I'm describing here, which is some 50 years or a little more, um, been driven by the very subjective idea that if you have uh, a relationship to nature, if you have natural light, if you have a good view, if you have a changing climate which changes with the seasons, then it will, be, it will be healthier. But that's always been very subjective until t 
2016. And here you see um, the, uh, the test bed that enabled the Harvard School of Public Health to quantify the benefits of a green building, a normal building, or a super green building. And what the people at the upper level who were doing various kinds of tests, mental tests and so on, uh, didn't know is that the plant room below was changing the environment to simulate the conditions of these different buildings. And um, here, in a nutshell, are some of those findings. But the three, uh, the three kind of critical peaks, crisis response, use of information, and processing that for strategy, scientifically proves something which, over many decades, was very subjective. Um, if I talk about those qualities in a building, it's arguably much easier to do that in a rural area of California, much more difficult in the heart of a kind of throbbing capital city. And this is the Bloomberg headquarters. And those fins are the gills which enable the building to breathe. So they filter, they attenuate the sound, so it's very quiet inside, although it's quite noisy outside. This is a cross-section through the building, and you can see that the movement of air is concentrated with the vertical movement of pedestrians within this building and the way in which natural light can come above. So again, it's a very holistic way of bringing these often completing challenges together. The vortex starts at the ground floor and then it spirals up into what is called the pantry. So socially, everybody has to come here before they go to their actual floor of workplace. So this is the kind of social hub. And I just want to have a few words about innovation. You'll see that there is a hardwood floor there. How do you reconcile the idea of a hardwood floor with technology where you want access immediately to wiring? And how can that work in an office environment where normally you would have carpet? The answer is the ceiling, and the ceiling is doing many different jobs. The floor, incidentally, was an invention of ours, and that is the wood, the hardwood, has a magnetic layer, and that enables it to cling to the full access floor below. So it's total flexibility. And acoustically, that is possible because of the ceiling. And the ceiling has two and a half million of these little petals, and 50,000 of those has a little LED. And chilled and warm water can pulse through that ceiling, so it's working acoustically, it's part of the heating cooling, it's modifying those times when it's too cold outside or too hot, and you want to modify that climate in a controlled and energy-efficient way. And we conducted research with our own engineers and created this laboratory to test that. And these little pillars are simulating and monitoring their people at a, at a desk. So the research was really quite a key element. And that's really just one glimpse of a belief in, in, in research. Um, if you go to a bathroom in this building, it will look completely normal. What you will not know is that it's using a system that was patented and which is in use in every uh, airliner that's currently flying in the world. It's a vacuum system. So it operates on a fraction of the amount of water. The water's harvested and it's co totally uh, recycled. And as Kent said, so far this building has achieved the highest rating for sustainability of, of any building so far uh, built. That interest in aviation and as a kind of aviator, uh, passionate pilot, uh, interested in all things uh, about aviation and curious about uh, locomotives, transportation and so on, then um, we had the opportunity with our first airport London's third airport, to question this model. If you transport yourself back into the 1990s, the end of the 20th century, this was a typical terminal. And if you looked up, it was full of services, um, ducts, moving air, um, roof-mounted uh, plant, mechanical plant that would service that. And because it was dark, you'd need lots of electric light generating heat. So 
the radical move here in a sustainable direction and a humanistic direction was literally to turn that upside down. All that heavy equipment would go below the concourse, would feed from below. So you had 24 hours, seven days, every day of the year access to it. And you would get the benefits of natural light and the energy savings that would come from it. We developed that model. It became a model for other architects, planners. It's an established uh, model. Um, and most recently, uh, we started with the opportunity for a competition for uh, International Airport Mexico City to see if we could push this idea further forward. So here, in that image, you'll see a curved roof and you'll see vertical glass walls. What if you could have a skin that would encompass the links to the aircraft, uh, the windows, um, and by taking that approach, you could create bigger uh, spans. You could create far more interesting space. So that leaps from 36 meters to 170 meters. And that continuous skin then becomes, as I described it, the expression of the building. To explain this concept to the jury, I made a, with my colleagues uh, a small film, and it was really to convey a centuries-old idea before architects became involved in buildings. What were people doing uh, at a very basic building level, mostly around the Mediterranean, the so-called Catalan vault? And that is that if you hold a piece of rope, um, then under compression, it will describe a very beautiful, very, very efficient curve. And if you could freeze that and you turn it the other way, then it becomes the perfect tensile structure. And going back in, in time with that knowledge and working with several universities and students using very basic materials, earth, but with a high-tech additive, we created a prototype drone port, uh, which has since become a permanent pavilion uh, in, in Venice. And here you can see the group of us, the, the, the students, uh, realizing that. And it's a reminder, perhaps, that if we want to look far ahead to the future, then perhaps first we should look far back and learn from history. The application of that line of thought uh, to creating a series of experiments in the desert uh, on the fringe of Abu Dhabi um, for a research facility, a small university, the start of a larger community um, uh, to explore renewable energies, Mazdar. Uh, but first, we wanted to learn how, before an age of cheap, energy, how a community living in the desert could transform a very hostile environment into a very elegant, livable um, habitation. And here, if you take the kind of cuts as you move uh, from the desert, scorching heat, then uh, as you get into the public spaces of that city that I showed in the desert, you'll see that the temperature drops as a result of orientation shade. If you go into a courtyard, then by evaporative cooling, the temperature comes down further. Finally, you go inside the home, and because of the massive insulation, it's cool without any refrigeration. So if we applied those lessons as we did in Mazda, then we start to create spaces which are habitable, which are benign, notwithstanding the fact that the, the temperature in the center, western style, is totally unbearable unless you're inside an air-conditioned car. And then we move across and we see the student accommodation and we see the university labs, the two uh, principles uh, of, of expression. And here is the public space at Mazdar. Uh, what you don't see is 
Below there, and this is going back now nearly 10 years, is we're seeing robot cars, we're seeing induction charging of those cars, and we're seeing all the servicing that makes possible at that upper uh, level, which is also elevated, so it's taking advantage of the cooler desert breezes just above the, uh, the floor of the, of, of the desert. So again, uh, working holistically. And that really driven by uh, some 40% of the power generated by this 10 megawatt uh, solar uh, array. It's not to suggest that renewables offer a future in terms of countering uh, emissions, greenhouse gases. Um, energy and industry, the production of energy and industry is the major generator of those greenhouse gases. Um, buildings and the connections between them, the mobility between them, 20%, and agriculture a significant 24%. Uh, so uh, if, if we're to look at the implications of the melting polar regions and the effects that that could have, given that 75% of the world's cities are on the coast and 50% of the population within 100 kilometers of that. And we pull back and we see a satellite image of those, of those cities. Then, uh, as had been noted earlier, the future, our future is the reality, is it's global, global cities. And although they consume 70% of the of the energy and are responsible so far for 70% of the emissions, which has to be uh, addressed. The reality is that they are also the generators of wealth. A typical city can generate as much wealth as a, as a country. So New York generates the equivalent GDP of the whole of Canada. If you take London, it's the equivalent of the Netherlands. If you take a port city like Osaka, it's the equivalent of the GDP of Switzerland. Um, and it's also worth noting that one in eight currently live in, in slums. Uh, what does that mean? It means that a significant part of the world in this image of one city, South America, Sao Paulo, uh, has access to everything that those on the other side don't have. In other words, they don't have adequate shelter, they don't have clean water, modern sanitation or access to power. Access to power is arguably the key to so many things. And we're talking here of something like 14% over a billion uh, people. And uh, this kind of glimpse of illegal connections to power and the fire hazards of that in terms of kind of shanty construction. Um, and Pat, the next, uh, this is really, in a nutshell, saying that those societies which have access to power are right up there, essentially it's Japan, America, it's Europe, um, and those societies further, further down, excuse me, um, interestingly, which don't have access to power, don't have the same, and it's obvious, life expectancy, uh, infant mortality, um, enlightenment, and significantly, right at the bottom, those are the war zones. The war zones are those places that don't have access to power. There is, there is a, an inevitable uh, link. Um, and if we're talking about uh, a population which by 2050 is estimated to move from 7.5 billion uh, to 10 billion, and 70% of that will be urban, then you're looking uh, at the potential for one in three to be in those slum uh, conditions. To put that into perspective, um, the, the idea that you question the current strategy in terms of how you address slums. Our proposition was really uh, almost naively simple, and that is that the current 
strategy in the absence of the involvement of those professions concerned with design, the political mantra is you bulldoze them and start again, which has not worked. And the scale uh, of this issue is so large that it's, it's, it, it's, never, it's never going to work. The other idea is that, is that the, the slum is a place of despair and not a place of hope. And it was quite interesting, the insights from one project in India, Duravi. Uh, and just to put Duravi, where we started to get an insight into some of these issues with a small team. Um, if you can imagine a site which is half the area of Central Park and has two-thirds of the population of Manhattan. Uh, Manhattan is 1.6 million. And this site here in Daravi, and that's the same uh, outline, is one million people. And um, that view cone there is pointing towards some new buildings. The new buildings were in an area which had been bulldozed, and new buildings, as an answer, you can see ring there, those new buildings in the background. And the team exploring that looking at the, uh, the bulldoze site and the recreated 14-story buildings. These are the only buildings which have modern sanitation. And they were completely empty, abandoned, unused. The space at the bottom we, was used for cricket by the, uh, by the children in the, in the community. And, um, and here you can see the team ringed. And they're having tea with the community leaders and they're asking the question, I mean, those buildings are empty, the site was bulldozed, why are they not in use? And the answer was discovered just through seeing the economy uh, and the needs, the physical needs of that community, who essentially process something like 80% of the waste of, of Mumbai. And the kind of accommodation that they need is essentially layered. It could not work. They could not sustain economically their life in those, those new buildings. So the, the idea that this is a poor community most certainly is, but in relevant, in, 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 if, if you relate it back to the agricultural uh, community from which they fled, then it's moving into an area of affluence. And there are all kinds of uh, side stories on this, the way in which they uh, bring together uh, teachers from the state uh, system and essentially create a private form of education. And you see kids immaculately dressed with ties and really quite extraordinary. So that led to the proposition that if you reduced at key points, the density, you could thread an infrastructure of services and you could regenerate those communities from within. It's at this point, relatively recently, and this is going back uh, about a little over a year and coming together here uh, around this table in the foundation. And the foundation is in every sense completely separate from the practice. So uh, I'm re really wearing two hats. I'm the common denominator between the work of the foundation, which generates out globally from Madrid, and the headquarters of the practice, which is in London. So they're separate in, in every sense. And this around the table uh, is the coming together with MIT to look at some of these issues and the application longer term of, of, of technology. And um, along the way, this was one proposition that I made to reduce the energy demands, uh, a heart unit, which was generated by the needs of a slum, but like anything that would address the issues of a slum, would have a spin-off into the formal city, so it would improve the quality of life. So, for example, if you could compress, if all the elements um, in a house, the heating, the cooling, the refrigerator, uh, the, the bathroom, the, the, the storage, if those could holistically talk to each other and compress into a much smaller unit, then whether that was addressing the issue in a slum 
or creating more affordable housing or creating in luxury housing terms less space occupied by certain elements and in that proposition I invoked the uh, in India the technology of the what was then the most affordable car at the time this is going back some years it's Tata uh, Nano and um, I met uh, Ratan Tata uh, one of the key family members behind this great kind of manufacturing empire in India and I shared these ideas for his opinion and he was totally supportive and I said something like what if we could try on a pilot project uh, how could you help and he said well f first you need a, a smaller slum so you could work uh, more directly with the group and also you would need to find a community which had a sympathetic um, civic leader, um, a politician who really believed in it, it wasn't corrupt. And, um, and so that was, we th it was a very nice meeting. Um, and the foundation is meanwhile working on these issues. And then it's about, must have been about after that meeting, two years, three years, and I got a phone call from Ratan Tata and he said, I shared your ideas with a politician who is the chief minister of one of the poorest states in, in India, Odisha, has a major slum project. He um, was totally uh, enthusiastic. What's followed from that is the uh, land rights to slum dwellers, which enables them then to start with a bank loan and so on. So he said, there's a big ceremony handing out certificates in three weeks' time. Can you come? And this was last year. And, um, and so that led to this meeting here. On the right-hand side is the newspaper of that time, which is the theme of the proposition, that instead of evicting and bulldozing, you empower them and you regenerate from within. And there's the chief minister, Ratan Tata, in, in the center and myself and we started with a slum uh, community uh, Sahi Baba um, uh, in, um, uh, in Odisha and, um, and we met with the community and the community to our surprise had prepared a presentation in the foreground is a drone photograph of their community and in that sense the drone technology made possible the mapping in the background is something that they prepared in the foreground in the back of that image there's a swamp you won't recognize it but they produced their vision map and this fascinating when we questioned and challenged them on this uh, it's just a really serious piece of design. For example, in the heart of it, they wanted a cyclone shelter. And the, the premise was, if we had a cyclone shelter, then we wouldn't have to leave our community in the event of a, a cyclone. We would be here in place to you know, guard our property. Uh, and I said something like this landscaping at the bottom here, uh, around the, uh, the, oh yes, if we increase the landscaping there, then that's the direction that the storms come from. So it would modify our climate. And at the top is a playground. So they said, of course, if you drained the swamp there, then we would have space. So, um, and at this point I said, you know, who are the architects? And these are the architects. Uh, and amazing, amazing piece of design. That led on to a number of projects. These are really early days. We haven't been active on these projects now, not for a year, almost a year. Um, so we're looking at another settlement called Neuhus uh, Sahi, uh, and that is um, just a few facts about the extreme weather there and the effects of that weather on the kind of structures and the way in which a more robust structure has withstood that cyclone. I should say that these, all the images I'm showing here are taken by our team. We have a team which is now resident there working with these uh, communities and liaising with the project uh, group in the foundation uh, in Madrid with a kind of backwards and forwards um, movement. We sent questionnaires out in advance of our visits to these different communities 
And interestingly, uh, the one on the left is, what would you like your community have? The one on the right is, what would you like your family to have? And uh, out of these various questionnaires, you know, the first thing is a roof, a roof that doesn't leak. The second are the walls. In terms of the community, it's about water uh, first. Um, and in another survey, once they got past this, the next stage was what's, what, what's next, and that's a job and education. So uh, it's been a fascinating insight. This is the aerial view of this community, on the water, with the beach. And if you, you can see, again, this community, like the first one, has a swamp at the back. And that gave the clue, if you drained it, for the way in which you could reduce the density, manipulate, create a degree of public space and address some of the major issues in this community. Um, trying to condense one year into a few, few minutes, um, the idea is to produce a scalable model, something that we can document the clues were given from that first community where they were using a vision map. So visually literate and able in a very sophisticated way to understand two-dimensionally major design issues. And so as a pilot project which would enable others, producing a manual films, enable others to, to spread the effect of these studies and working with the, with the different groups individually. And finally, that is the master plan. And what happens is you can see that the swamp has become reclaimed land and there are very, very clearly defined routes. And each of those different groups and the women, again, were very, very powerful in terms of design and involvement. And they were responsible for the cross routes, the cross routes which would deliver security and access to a far wider range of, of, of homes. Here you can see recognizably in the background the master plan. And, and the next image is the approval of that master plan. Work on the ground has started, but it is somewhat painful in a way because coming to the premise of what Kent was summarizing, you realize the inadequacy in these conditions uh, of, of the mega grid, the big power station, uh, the massive amount of excavation with pipes. This is the start of a toilet block in that community, a part of the master plan now under construction. Um, and leads to the proposition of what if, what if in a community like this, you could be autonomous, you could plant a box, deliver power. Uh, and as a reminder, there's probably right now, there's probably up, moving up to 200 million people on this planet who are not served by any kind of heavy infrastructure. They may be on a train, they may be in a cruise liner, or they're in an aircraft. Uh, so there's a global population on the move, unconnected. What lessons could we learn from space? There have been very interesting initiatives derived from space. The Gates Foundation has been working on this. Power is a key element. It's not possible in the density uh, and whether it's the density of a slum or the desirable high density of a formal city as we know it here, it's not possible to have the surface area for, uh, for solar cells. And what about the mobility revolution? Um, right now, the amount of road that was devoted to highways in the 60s and 70s is being ripped up changing to greenery, whether that's the big dig in Boston in America, whether it's in Seoul in Asia, whether it's in Madrid in, in, in Europe. What happens to those parking structures when vehicles are moving autonomously, pretty continuously, on call through our cell phone? Ownership has become something uh, that's, that's very perhaps marginal. Uh, and is mobility three-dimensional? And um, so 
what are the examples which might demonstrate, as Bucky would advocate, the power and the importance of a higher performance, doing more with less, and striving to have a higher quality of life, not just for those who are dispossessed, but for everybody uh, alike. Um, more with less, urban farming, uh, has been demonstrated already to produce produce which is more flavorful, delicious, uses a fraction of the water, and would urban farming lead to a greener, quieter, cleaner uh, city? Um, a market embedded in the heart of a city. What lessons might we uh, gain from insights into, uh, into innovation in the world of medicine? Uh, Many of us, myself, have experienced an MRI, a huge piece of equipment, and you move into it, um, it weighs a huge amount, it costs millions and millions, um, occupies a lot of space, um, is unaffordable for screening, say, for breast cancer. The foundation is interested in innovation and really anxious to learn, and we were addressed by this lady, Mary Lou Jepson, uh, uh, extraordinary uh, lady who has created uh, and is about to go on the market something which is one million times more effective than that MRI that I showed. It's a fabric. It could be the dress that she's wearing. Another example of perhaps doing more with less. And again, the computer which we take for granted um, in the 40s, you know, it was occupying a mega room. Then there was enormous breakthrough. It's actually mobile on four wheels um, a few decades later. We now take for granted it's something we can put in our briefcase. And if you look at all these things around the edge, then some of them have become totally obsolete, like the typewriter. It's an antique. My kids have never seen a typewriter until I bought one for them. Um, uh, and, and whether it's the camera, the torch, the calculator, uh, being transformed by one handheld uh, device. So if we applied and power, um, I only recently discovered through some of the researches that we've been doing with MIT, that in the 1960s and up there still are satellites which are nuclear powered, miniaturized. This is something from a meeting that took place at MIT with a group, and it's literally delivering power in a container. Um, if the hopeful future is fusion, then fission in its new form, uh, notwithstanding all the prejudices against the power stations, but it's a, it's a way of thinking. It's interesting that when you talk to groups who can deliver power up to 20 megawatts in a container, and you talk about the potential of maybe it's a box, so it's not serving a community, it's just below the surface and it's servicing a house. Um, it never ever occurs to them to question the grid, because it comes as a prior assumption. So a power station, in everybody's mind, has to be mega. It has to be the size, or twice, or three times the size of this building. So autonomy, is mentally something that is out there, out in the Arctic, or if it's Canada, it's somewhere in, in, in the wilds. What if in parallel with that, you were talking about, and this is a serious project with MIT, the idea that you can genetically modify to produce a tree which during the day harvests energy, and at night it glows, and it's street lighting. So your street lighting, is an avenue of, of trees. What if you plant a seed to grow a building? This is nature doing that and creating a bridge. But what if you were to plant a seed in the sense that we are all grown from seeds like the trees? So it leads to the manifesto, which comes full circle back to Kent. Questioning, power without grids, sanitation without sewers, meat without animals, Mobility without autos, food without soil, and buildings without construction. The start of the conference. Thank you.